Hi, welcome to Custody Matters Live with Danica Joan and Wendy Perry. Today's special guest is Cal Alexander, a father of four who's been separated from his children for nearly a decade. And he's, he's an author. He's got a book coming out uh, called X's and O's. And he's the director of Forged Together Ministry, which is geared to strengthening and undergirding uh, families families who are going through high conflict uh, custody situations and so forth. So welcome to the show, Cal. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Danica. Hey, Wendy. How are you? Great. So glad to have you with us tonight. Very, very um, excited to hear about you've got some big announcements, some important things happening. So looking forward to having you share that with everyone. So Absolutely. Yeah, tell us a little bit about you, a little a little bit about your backstory, but also more importantly, what it is that it's had, what it's provided for you in being of service to other families in your own situation. Well, to 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 really get to the, the base of the story, um, ten years ago, I ended up a little bit before that. My ex and my four kids ended up moving to Florida. And in the process, we were living away from family. We started out a brand new venture there. Things were going well until the economy ended up tanking and being in the, the home building and construction business. Um, it just really took a major hit on my business. So with the economy going bad, um, just different strife with the financial on that end. My ex-wife decided, well, at the time, my wife decided to go ahead and leave me and took the four kids, filed for divorce, and then moved up to the Chicago area, leaving me with pretty much all the bills and uh, no place to live. Uh, as a result, I ended up homeless, really without any hope, and ended up having to go through the whole legal system in Florida with the dissolution of marriage. And then... Uh, as soon as that was taken care of, the judge down in Florida decided that he was going to allow my ex-wife to stay in, in Illinois with my four children, but give me visitation rights only by traveling to Illinois with, no, with uh, no overnights, just one time a month. And in the process, he uh, ordered my visitation. She didn't allow me to go ahead and see the kids. She ended up making every excuse under the sun to try to keep me from them. And in this whole process, I felt like there was really no hope in everything. Uh, all friends ended up uh, just ignoring me. I really had no place to go with, with everything. Uh, my health was failing me. And it just became just a very difficult place to be a very dark so in the process, I had a friend that told me, well, you know what, maybe you need to start doing some journaling. And in the process of doing the journaling, I ended up going ahead and starting to write a book. And seven years ago, I started out with this venture, and the first journal that I ended up doing uh, was really just based off of how to love your kids from a distance. And when you're 1,200 miles away, it makes it very difficult to to really figure out how to juggle that. How, how do I go ahead and speak to them? How do I go ahead and love them from one state to another? And in that whole journey of trying to, fig try trying to figure that little portion out, my ex-wife decided to go ahead and take me back to court, but this time in Illinois, accusing me of domestic violence and um, just other different things. And in the, the process, we ended up going through a two-year battle up in Illinois with a totally different judge. And he eventually ended up taking away all my parental rights with no visitation, no communication with the children. And she decided to go ahead and create stories uh, for her own benefit, uh, trying to get a house for herself, cars for herself, um, just many of these different things. And when I was going through this whole process to try and to, to deal with the, the rejection from the kids and the battle with the court and 
all that, I ended up coming up with pretty much a whole list of the different things of what this book would entail. So I ended up journaling things of, this is really my reality, the things that I'm going through, going through the courts, and going through this rejection of the children, and really understanding how to go ahead and talk to them, navigate even through the high conflict with my ex-wife. Um, but as I was writing this book, I felt like there was just one more piece that I needed to put into it. And the most important piece had to be about forgiveness and learning how to continuously forgive my ex-wife for all the injustices and forgiving the judge and forgiving my kids and forgiving other people that have accused me falsely of stuff. And uh, it's been a refreshing uh, journey, but it's been a very difficult and dark journey at the same time. Wow. Wow. You know, it, it really, the forgiveness aspect, I totally get that. I get that with, that people involved, some of them had good intentions, I'm sure, that just wanted to be there, that were, that were told a story and their heartstrings were pulled and they wanted to be part of the solution and yet they were part of, uh, you know, an accomplice to to further damage um that's not an easy thing to forgive no it's not an easy thing to forgive and the the hardest thing a lot of people don't really understand is with pa um you have one parent that is extreme just for either payback to to the other parent or manipulation or to try to get more money and child support or just a whole gamma of different things. And the other parent is trying to find some kind of compromise in order to, to get to the children and to bring a, a sense of stability. But it feels like the one that's trying to bring that sense of stability ends up getting violated by the other one mm -hmm. on a continual basis. And that was one of those things that I ended up feeling when I was going through this whole process uh, with my ex-wife. Because when we ended up filing for the divorce in Florida, the laws read that <coughs> child support was based off of the combined income of both parents. Um, and then it was predicated off of how much visitation time that she had. And at the time, the judge down in Florida uh, said that she was going to have 80%, I would have 20%. So my burden of um, child support was basically based off of 80% of the total income of both of them together times the four children. What she didn't like was she felt that it would, should have been 100%. And it would have created for me to pay out about 60 to 70% of all of my income to my ex-wife after taxes. Mm -hmm. And her goal was to go up to Illinois or find a judge that would go ahead and take away all of my visitation rights in order to create for more money at the end of the day. Mm. And that was one of those things that she was playing with. But the, the thing that was interesting was by the time that she ended up getting the um, no visitation on my end, the state of Florida had finally changed their laws on child support. So now she's using it as kind of a manipulation with, with other organizations to raise money on her behalf, which is a totally different story. But you, but you shifted that. The thing is, is like I, I get that you were going through what you were going through, but what had you shift from focusing on your situation that had to have been very disempowering to shifting to something that was more as an advocate and and I also want to touch on maybe on your book that you that you wrote. Well, I felt like I had no other choice but to because if I ended up focusing on all the negative stuff that was going on between my ex and I, it would have kept me in bondage to where I felt like there was no hope even for my kids 
And in fact, um, one of my children, he ends up coming to me and he goes, Dad, you know, um, you have no idea how, how much, how this divorce has really affected me. He goes, all I wanted was just a normal life. And he goes, now I have no hopes. I have no dreams as a result. And when you hear that as a parent, it, it, it just rips you apart. It's one of those things that you just don't ever want to hear your kids say, well, because of what's going on with you and mom, it's now taken away all of my hopes and all of my dreams. And after he had said that to me, I thought, you know, I can't live in this place of, of feeling in bondage, feeling in conflict at all times. I've got to go ahead and raise above that because if my kids don't have hope with the direction of where they're going, but yet I can see the potential of hope for them. Um, and I'm too distracted with the confines of the conflict with my ex. I can't give them what they need. Mm -hmm. And it just became a journey of just trying to breathe that light back into them. But before I could even be able to, to do that and give that to them, I had to go I had to find that hope, even for myself, that came through my faith, that came through um, my church and uh, just other different friends networking in that way. Cal, I wanted to ask you uh, about, you said it was a process that you went through to get to where you are now, um, where you're in a, a positive mindset, um, you have um, given some forgiveness. So what was going on during that process um, and how much of that process had to do with the journaling that you were doing because I think that um, journaling can be a really important healing exercise for targeted or alienated parents so um, how important was the journaling and and was that a big part of that process um, and then I wanted to ask you when did you realize that this journaling needs to be a book well it's kind of funny because the journaling um, it's, it started off with just a lot of complaining about what was going on, complaining about the judge, complaining about the situation, complaining about my ex-wife, complaining about not seeing my children. And the more that I journaled, the less that stuff became part of what my journals were. And it was more of prayers to God and requests and just really focusing on what is it that I need in, in this whole situation? And who is it that I can go ahead and rely on, depend on? And the thing that has been just rewarding is God has brought certain people into my life to go ahead and really build me up. And in one of my counseling sessions, I had uh, my counselor, he said, he, he would always ask me, who is your support group? Who are the three people that you can go ahead and go to and ball your eyes out or go ahead and just be real in front of? And um, God gave me my fiance and I, I, I can't even put it to words how grateful I am to her in this process. She has seen me in my good times, my bad times. Um, She's been an encouragement to me, and she has been one of the ones that has spurred me on in a lot of those different things. But uh, God has just really brought people in at the right time and took people out at the right time and has created for just an environment to allow me to have the correct mindset at the end of the day with a lot of this that was going on. Yeah, you, you know, you you had to deal with battles across state lines. That has been a real difficult thing for some of our parents, our viewers, uh, in dealing with with two different um, jurisdictions, and of course the money issues. Not everybody has a deep pockets to be able to to fight for this. And it's my understanding that you at at some point in time, you had to actually go pro se to, to fight for your rights. 
Absolutely. I actually had um, four different attorneys in my case, two down in Florida, two in Illinois. And I had one of them that um, had been disbarred because of malpractice. I had another one that was threatened by a judge, another one that, two other ones that ended up dropping my case because it's just getting so complex. And it's already hard enough to go through this whole process, the conflict with, with an ex-spouse and the rejection from your children and the neglect from family and friends and other different people, that when you end up having your attorney going ahead and disappearing on you, um, you start asking yourself, well, how am I going to go ahead and get through this? And truthfully, if someone ended up coming up to me and saying, hey, you're going to go ahead and spend a hundred or hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars in legal costs and in this battle of trying to uh, preserve who you are and to preserve your relationship with your kids, I would have just lost my mind. Um, but continuously putting myself into a position of stepping forward and moving forward um, has put me into the place of being able to take care of each and everything and I had to compartmentalize. It, it wasn't one of these things of just constantly, oh well, I have stuff that I've got to go ahead and do. It's just like, what can I go ahead and take care of today? And sometimes it's just a little tiny thing Sometimes it was just to go ahead and get a nap or just to get the rest that I needed. Other days it was to go ahead and write a motion or to take care of a response or to go ahead and do the things in court. But a lot of it um, was really just focusing on what am I supposed to do today and how can I go ahead and take care of what I need to take care of. Um, and that was just kind of the approach that I had to take when it came to the courts and when I had to help to some of the other things that were going around, even just the survival uh, daily. When you talk about this process that you went through for healing and went through forgiveness, I'm wondering, um, is it something where now you feel like, I'm done, the process is complete, or is it an ongoing yeah. thing, you know? I mean, is it oh, something, I <laughs> right? Can you kind of speak to that a little bit um, about, um, how do you get through a, a rough day? You know, do you rely on your journaling? Um, do you uh, go to one of your support people? Uh, what advice would you have for alienated parents when you go through those rough days? Because you've made so much progress with healing and forgiveness, but yet you still have some hard days. So how do you get through those hard days? And, and what advice would you have for other parents on their tough days? Sure. It's... Um the reality is that there, there's really no one given thing that you that you have to do, but I think it's a combination of stuff. Uh, you really need to go ahead and have many different things going on between the journaling, between the exercise, between eating right, between going ahead and really having some of those confidants that you can actually talk to and be real with, um, and just really getting out. I think one of the most dangerous things that I ended up finding myself spiraling out of control is trying to separate from everything and everybody. And as a result, you end up finding yourself going into deeper depression. You end up finding yourself going into places just worrying about your kids and worrying about things that you have no control over. And that was one of the most important things is understanding that I don't have to have control over everything. I don't have to control what my children are thinking today. I don't have to control uh, what is being said of me. Uh, I don't have to control some of these other different things. And when I gave up a lot of that control and allowed God to go ahead and take care of those things, if there was something that was stressing me out or something that was creating for a problem, I would take it to somebody and talk to it or I'd go ahead and pray about it, or I'd go ahead and make a quick note and, and put it by the side of my computer so that I can go ahead and just really think about some of those good times, and just some of the, the promises that, that uh, are in store for my children.
potential. I think what you just said is huge. Letting go of controlling or trying to control. And I hear that a lot with alienated parents where they feel like if they could just remind the kids, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, right. that, that that somehow is going to um, change or control the situation. But I mean, of course, our kids remember that. They know that that you know I'm the mom and, and you're their dad. That they never forget that. They think about us every day. But I, I think that it, it's so hard for us to accept and understand that we cannot control that situation um, by making demands or reminding them I'm your parent. Uh, so I think it's so important that you made that point. And I loved what you said earlier about learning how to love your kids from a distance because like you had a physical distance in addition oh, yeah. to, in addition to the emotional distance but um all alienated parents have need to learn how to do that how to love your kids from a distance because whether you're living five miles from them or 500 miles from them it, it's still loving them from a distance when you're an alienated parent Absolutely. And the, the thing that's unique about that, and this is what I end up covering in, in that chapter that I wrote the book, is that it requires for a parent to really get to know and understand your children, but not to, to just understand and know them, but to be creative in a way of really thinking about them. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, each one of my kids, I ended up making them with a specific purpose in mind. And it's just been very interesting that their names are just starting to gel with exactly their characteristics of who they are. And as a result, it's allowed me to go ahead and think, well, how would this one go ahead and think? And how would that one think? And as a result, it's given me the opportunity to go ahead and write cards, to, to buy specific things for them with them in mind. So often it's, it's very easy to just go ahead and just buy a gift and say, oh, well, happy birthday or Merry Christmas mm -hmm. or whatever it, it, the, the occasion is. Um, and that's kind of what I, I would do with my ex-wife when we were married is we would put thought into it, but I don't think that I would, that I put as much deep thought into it as what I do today. I use a lot of creativity and I, end up going ahead and trying to challenge and boost myself to a point to where I have to think outside of the box. I have to think more about my kids and who my kids are and what they might be going through, what they're struggling with. Um, and like you said, it, it's not always about how many miles are my kids away. It's what are my kids going through at this point. Mm. So how would your book how, how do you think that your book will benefit other parents who've gone through, who are going through what you've been through? I think it's going to, to be different from one parent to another. There's a lot of, it depends on even where you are in the whole journey. If you're at the beginning, it's going to give you greater understanding of what to do and some of the pitfalls to avoid. It's going to, for someone that's been in it, for years, like myself, um, it's going to allow them an understanding of what they've gone through in order to go ahead and get a healing, and then prepare themselves for uh, the opportunity of reconciliation with their children. Mm. Definitely. You know, I, I acknowledge you for not only, I mean, going through what you've gone through, it's so easy to get bitter and it's easy to claim the victim card um, and, and ignore the fact that there's so thousands of people who've gone through what you've gone through. And that sometimes, you know, we can take this up as, a, as an opportunity to help those, um, you know, help those who are experiencing it for the first time uh, and walk them through. And uh, I thank you for that. Thank you for the book. Well, uh, well one of the things that I, I 
tell a lot of people. Um, I, I've been told, oh, you've gone through a, a, a joke journey. You've lost everything, and God will eventually restore it. And I find myself having to correct them because I feel in a lot of ways that I end up going through a Joseph journey. God has given me a promise, and then all of a sudden, everything ends up falling apart. And you find yourself going through major adversity and a, a, an emotional prison in, in a lot of ways. But you still are holding on to that dream that God has gone ahead and given you. And at the end, if it wasn't for the process, there would be no, no point to where we can go ahead and come to the, the realization of reconciliation. And that was just something that I, I realized, even with Joseph's life, that he had to take 20 years in order to come to a point of being reconciled with his brothers and reconciled with his family again. And it created for a lot of hardship that he had to go through before he could even get to the point of forgiveness and mm -hmm. um, not holding on to bitterness and not uh, blaming them. And that's just kind of the process that I've had to go through in a lot of ways with just having to reset my mind and reset my thinking and forgive some of these things that have gone on. And if I end up going to the point of holding on to the injustice, I never come to the point of having forgiveness and grace. Rather, I end up with that of just bitterness. And, Cal, what you're saying is so important in regards to the person that we need to be uh, for when mm -hmm. our kids come back to us because our kids don't want to come back to us if we're uh, filled with rage and anger and hostility and we're not in a good place emotionally. So it's very important to to get that healing and to be in a healthy uh, emotional state of mind uh, for when our kids do come back. And I wanted to ask you about your ministry, the Forged Together Ministry, uh, because I, I wanted to learn more about that. Um, what does your ministry do? There are, there are three parts to it. I, and as I've been looking over the years, even with the, the falling apart of my family, I, I've realized that 50% of the families um, end up in divorce um, with marriage and stuff. And my goal with Forge Together is to really give the tools necessary to each and every person that they can go ahead and succeed in their marriages and in their families and have a legacy to go ahead and pass on to their children and grandchildren. Um, one of the things that I, I know is we all have broken parts and pieces. And when we end up getting married, we think that love is going to go ahead and heal those broken pieces. But the reality is, unless we understand how to go ahead and erase those pieces in an appropriate way and navigate with the other person that has their own broken pieces, we're never going to go ahead and survive or we're going to go ahead and hand down a legacy that will be broken even to our children at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well, we have about two minutes left, and I wanted to point out that for, uh, next Tuesday show will be the very last of our Parental Alienation Awareness Month spotlights. Um, Wendy, you have some things coming up to to kind of wrap up your Parental Alienation Awareness Month uh, activities. Can you talk about that? Um, I picked up a few proclamations yesterday from a few of our uh, local mayors, which was great. Uh, the city of Keller, Texas, and the city of Watauga, Texas, uh, gave their proclamations yesterday. And they've always been very supportive of Mental Alienation Awareness Day. Both of those cities have always given us a proclamation. So it's always great to uh, pick up those proclamations, and especially when they read the proclamation and you get to have a conversation with them. So I got to pick up a few proclamations yesterday. Um, I will be having an event uh, this year, actually on Saturday the 27th, at, um, it's called Bumper Shoot Barbecue. It's a, a local um, outdoor barbecue place that is um, just real casual. 
family friendly, pet friendly. You can bring your you can bring your dogs and a uh, great barbecue. You know, drinks. Um, they usually have live music on the weekend, so um, they called. They actually called me today and said we're so looking forward to having Bubbles of Love here on on Saturday. And uh, so, it, you know, it's really great when you partner with somebody who is excited to have you there for your event. So that will be on uh, Saturday the 27th from, from 11 to 1. If anybody is in or near Dallas-Fort Worth and they want to more information about that, they can just get in touch with me. So, um, and there's a lot of great events around the world this week for parental alienation awareness. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, yes. We, yeah, I mean, it, Parental Alienation Awareness Day is April the 25th, which is this Thursday. Um, I know for me in Lakeland, Florida, that uh, I'm going to be on the radio at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time on uh, Hall Communications on uh, three, maybe four different stations they rotate me through and that I can uh, speak on. So I always love that opportunity to, to get out to, in the community of those uh, coming, coming, actually, you know, people going to work and be able to hear uh, what we're up to. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I just wanted to remind everybody, um, if there is a Parental Alienation Awareness Day event near you, to be sure to... Uh oh uh oh, it's signal. Uh, oh man, the signal got frozen. Hmm. 